This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. So now before we start the webinar, I would like to introduce, um, to take the opportunity to introduce Carissa Little, who will be hearing, who, will you, who you will be hearing from later today. Carissa Little is the Director for Professional Programs at the Stanford Center for Professional Development. She has been with Stanford University for 10 years and is responsible for collaborating with Stanford faculty, industry experts, and corporate partners to develop the professional and executive programs that extend Stanford to industry. She worked in both software and education prior to coming to Stanford. I agree, Varao, who will be the speaker today, is the co-director of the Stanford Innovation and Entrepreneurship Certificate. He's the Ethel McBean Professor of Organizational Behavior and Human Resource at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. He teaches courses such as Human Resource Management and teaches within two executive programs. He has published widely in the field of management and sociology and studies the social and cultural causes of, organiza of organizational change. His recent work investigates the role of social movements as motors of organizational change in professional and organizational fields. Rao has drawn on his knowledge and expertise to conduct workshops for British Petroleum, McDonald's, Bristol-Myers, General Electric, Microsoft, the FBI, and the intelligence com community. So now with that, I'd like to turn the floor over to Professor Hayagriva Rao. Good morning, everybody. My name is Hayagriva Rao, and I'm a professor at uh, Stanford's Graduate School of Business. It's a delight with you to be with you this morning. Uh, the theme of uh, today's webinar is killing ideas is way more important than collecting ideas. Um, let me signal what the main uh, proposition I'd like to advance uh, for all of you to think about. Often, when we think about innovation, we think about gathering as many ideas from people as possible. My contention is gathering is the easiest part. It's killing that's the hardest part. And when I say killing, I mean killing ideas, of course. Uh, the problem is, in most companies, we have a large supply of ideas. In fact, we have more ideas than we can usually implement. Firms, of course, have very few resources, and the ideas vary enormously in quality. And that's exactly why we have to select ideas. What would you like to do? Would you like to allocate $100 among 10 good ideas, where you give $10 for each good idea? Or would you like to pick two great ideas and put $50 in each of those ideas to ensure that they work? So killing ideas is a very, very important part of the innovation process. Unfortunately, however, in most companies, the way we go about organizing the process of killing ideas is such that it hinges on a committee, uh, often referred to as the murder boat. And what does the murder boat do? The murder boat not only kills the ideas, but invariably also subjects those proposing the ideas to ridicule, humiliation, and rejection, thereby killing their initiative. As a result, what happens is others who watched what's happened to their peers become even reluctant to supply ideas or submit ideas to the screening process or to any other forum that the organization might have. The sad result is that organizations that have hired very smart people organize a process of killing ideas such that these very smart people become dumb. And when I say dumb, I don't mean stupid. Smart people, of course, stay smart. They might even become smarter. What I mean by being dumb is they become mute, they become silent. I submit to you that the central challenge uh, in organizing innovation for any enterprise is the silence of its employees, particularly its smart employees. So that's really why we really need to think very carefully about how to organize the process of killing ideas. In fact, one might argue that the larger the firm, 
the greater are the rules, the constraints, uh, uh, you know, the maze of toll gates and uh, committees and what have you. Uh, and the more likely is it that the smart people hired by very large enterprises, they actually become silent and mute participants. Uh, the outcome, of course, uh, was wonderfully stated by one of my favorite playwrights, George Bernard Shaw. Uh, I went to Jesuit school many years ago in India, and George Bernard Shaw certainly was a staple of our education. And what I recall from that education uh, was a very memorable line uh, uttered by George Bernard Shaw. And as he put it, few people think more than two or three times a year. I have made an international reputation for myself by thinking once or twice a week. So that's really our challenge. How do we design a process for killing ideas in organizations such that people think as often as they can and as often as they should? And here, what I mean by thinking is somewhat different, presumably, from what uh, the, the conception you might entertain, some of you might entertain. We often consider thinking to be a verb, but thinking is an adverb. You think when you do something. So how do we think? We think when we talk to ourselves. We think when we read a book. We think when we compose an email. We think when we're in a group. And uh, we think in meetings. And that's how organizations actually think. Uh, let me provoke you with a very interesting study conducted by McKinsey in 2007. The study's goal was a very simple goal. Had a very, the study had a very simple goal, namely to ask or to find out what is the greatest predictor of innovation performance. And what McKinsey did was they actually surveyed executives and managers in a variety of industries at very different levels uh, in the organization. So the first response, as you can see from this slide is, many people said, look, metrics and measures are the most important. Uh, and of course, we need clear criteria. We need success metrics. We need go criteria to make no-go no -go decisions and to have the ability to discontinue projects. But as the metrics pyramid indicates, it's also the smallest in size. After all, what's the use of metrics and measures if you don't have ideas to begin with in the first place? And that's why the idea generation pyramid is much larger than the metrics and measures pyramid. And where do we get ideas from? We get ideas from a variety of sources, often by observing customers directly. Um, that's uh, consumer observation helps us figure out what is it that frustrates consumers, what is it that pisses them off, what is it that makes them curse about the experience. And what's very important is when we find out what consumers are cursing about, we know that there is a problem worth solving. And not only is it a problem worth solving, it's also a problem where when you solve it, the consumers are willing to, of course, pay for it as well. Um, so ideas certainly are important very important. But even, how are ideas possible? They don't just come simply when you observe consumers. You need a climate within the enterprise, a climate that actually allows for experimentation, that allows for risk-taking, and that allows for knowledge sharing. And that is exactly why the climate pyramid is larger than the idea generation pyramid. And so we're left with the question, of course, of where does this climate come from? And it comes, uh, of course, from the leadership of the enterprise. And that's why the leadership pyramid is really the largest pyramid. And what leaders uh, ought to have are clear priorities. Uh, they ought to be able to protect and buffer innovation from constant interference and uh, excessive, if you will, evaluation uh, that might very well be premature. Now, McKinsey did a very interesting thing as well. In their survey, they actually asked people at the very apex of the enterprise, in the C-suite, they asked them, what do you think is the biggest problem of innovation in the firm? And strikingly, people in the C-suite said their challenge was the shortage of ideas. In fact, many of them said, we have resources, we have lots of money, we have lots of people, but we have very few ideas. 
uh, in a very nice move, McKinsey went down several steps in the hierarchy, and they asked people, what do you think is the biggest bottleneck of innovation? And people said, the bottleneck is very clear. Uh, it's at the very top of the enterprise. It's leadership that's the bottleneck. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, in a completely different executive program that I was teaching here at the uh, Graduate School of Business here at Stanford, one participant uh, put it very nicely. He said, Professor Rao, the bottleneck, of course, is always at the top of the bottle. Uh, and there you have it. You have a classic catch-22. Uh, you have uh, the people at the apex of the enterprise who say, we don't have ideas, and people, if you will, in the uh, lower uh, levels, closer to the front line, who say the bottleneck, of course, is at the top of the bottle. And the real question then is, how do we actually resolve this catch-22? And this is exactly why designing the process of killing ideas is really the most important thing in any enterprise. Instead of um, inundating you with study after study, I thought it might behoove us to consider the example of one striking organization. Allow me to take a sip of water. This is a company called Wright Solutions. They're based in Rhode Island. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, our case writer, David Hoyt, who's a brilliant case writer, I might add, um, we thought we ought to write a case study about the company because when we met the CEO and the COO, both of them told us they weren't the smartest people in the company. I recall very vividly meeting the CEO, Jim Lavoy, and he said, um, Professor Rao, I'm not the smartest person in this company. There are many other smarter people. We then met the COO, and he echoed the same thing. And I said, well, if you guys aren't the smartest guys in the company, uh, what exactly is it that you do? And that's when they said that their role as leaders was really to organize the process uh, for killing ideas, and their vehicle, their mechanism to do this was to, they created a stock market for collective genius that they called mutual fun. Note the name. It's mutual fun, and it's not mutual fund. So if the fun is important. It's not the fund that's important. A couple of things about uh, Right Solutions. Uh, right Solutions is a company with oh, approximately at the time uh, when we visited them 155 employees or so. Uh, they are located in uh, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and California. Uh, they specialize in computer visualization uh, and computer imaging services. Their clients are casinos, primarily in Las Vegas. And uh, the other big customer is the Department of Defense, particularly the Navy, who needs a lot of underwater surveillance uh, equipment to deter potential terrorists. So um, those are the two clients that uh, Right Solutions actually serves. Let's take a closer look at how they went about organizing the stock market for collective genius as a mechanism to kill ideas. And as you'll see, what's interesting about the process is it's one where instead of discouraging, cutting off oxygen for the future supply of ideas, in fact, it, it actually nourishes the supply of ideas so that ideas can be selected and the company can really sort of execute them. Mutual fund at Right Solutions is organized on the basis of some very simple principles. Every employee is given $10,000 of opinion money. And um, uh, what an employee can do with this opinion money is to buy savings bonds. Um, a savings bond, of course, is any cost-saving idea uh, issued by an employee. Um, employees, in addition to purchasing savings bonds, can also purchase stocks. Stocks are of two types. One type of stock uh, is called uh, Bow Jones. This means it's a new product idea for existing customers, namely casinos on the one hand and the Navy on the other. There's another category of stocks called SPASDAC, which means these are far out new product ideas for completely new customers, customers that Right Solutions hitherto had no experience in serving. 
Now, what's interesting about uh, um, the mutual fund uh, and the way it's implemented at Right Solutions is every employee with an idea can develop an expectus. It's exactly the analog of a prospectus in the stock market. What can you do with your expectus? You can't take it and simply put it on the stock market. Instead, you would have to get the support uh, some of, the, of one of the senior engineers in the company. These are people called profits. Now, you might ask, why is it that they require a person with an idea to get the support of a profit? The answer is simple. They don't want litter in the idea landscape of the enterprise. If there is no filter, if there is no sensor, all kinds of ideas tend to get put on the marketplace. And when people see the landscape littered with debris, nobody wants to visit the landscape. It's very much like seeking to visit a garden with a lot of litter. Why would we want to do that? And that's exactly why they actually have a filter. Now, what can other employees do once they see a savings bond or a stock? They can buy. Uh, the stock. Uh, they can use any of their opinion money of $10,000 to purchase the stock or savings bond. In addition, every savings bond or stock has a discussion thread. So, uh, for instance, if one of you comes up with an idea that says, hey, um, you know, uh, why are we paying, at, why are we at Right Solutions paying telecommunication firms uh, money for a PABX system? Why can't we do it ourselves? Uh, you know, I might come up with a suggestion, or you might come up with a suggestion, but neither of us might know how to write the code and implement it, and somebody else might actually say, well, here are five ways to implement the code. Uh, another person might say, wait a minute, this is actually a savings bond or a cost-saving idea. Why can't we make it a Bow Jones and actually offer this service, of course, to our casinos? So in which case, something that was a savings bond quickly moves into the... Um, Bow Jones category. Most of all, what employees can do in addition to purchasing stocks and offering suggestions is that they can volunteer time. Now here, Right Solutions follows a very interesting policy. Instead of um, informing employees that they can allocate 80% of their time to regular work and 20% of their time to something like mutual fund, Right Solutions does not actually uh, stipulate such a policy. Instead, the premise is 100% of your time, you have to work on regular projects because you do actually have regular projects that you have to work on for the Navy or for the casinos or whosoever contracts the services of right solutions. So if you want to really work in mutual fund, you really have to work using your own time, sometimes a weekend, sometimes after work hours. And the premise behind that is if it's valuable enough for you, to use your weekend time or your after, you know, after hours time, that means the idea itself is sufficiently compelling to you, uh, sufficiently worthwhile for you to actually invest the time and energy uh, that you require. Now, one of the striking things I must confess, when we were writing the case study and when we were visiting um, Right Solutions at um, Rhode Island, excuse me, <coughs> I apologize, I have a little bit of a cold and cough, so you might hear an occasional cold and cough throughout. Uh, as I was mentioning, one of the striking things uh, that I found certainly when David Hoyt and I were at uh, the offices of Right Solutions was after meeting the CEO, we actually met the receptionist of the firm. And what was astonishing was the receptionist actually had two savings bonds ideas on the stock market. And think of this, how many companies can have any of you been to where the firm says, my receptionist is a person with ideas and these ideas are worthwhile uh, for us to actually consider, um, uh, you know, in our um, um, ideal landscape, uh, as it were. I was uh, completely astonished uh, by the fact that the receptionist had uh, two such ideas. Both of them were savings bonds. They actually had to do, um, if I recall, with the company credit card um, now, the next slide kind of gives you a quick sense of the stock headlines that an employee sees when they actually log in to the right solutions uh, stock market. The headlines sort of look like that. Uh, they actually tell you, uh, you know, uh, uh, what are the you know, stock buckets, as it were, where is help wanted, what are the new investment opportunities, and the like. 
uh, one very important thing, uh, in this market there is no short selling. You cannot short someone else's stock. So the idea here is uh, not to denigrate a stock as much as uh, to actually purchase it or not purchase it. And, of course, the way ideas get killed is when nobody purchases your stock, nobody offers a suggestion, and nobody volunteers. What's very important about the right solution system is instead of a committee killing the idea, it's the community that kills an idea. What's also equally important is what happens to rejected ideas. They don't languish, they don't atrophy, they don't disappear, they actually become the raw materials, of course, to construct new ideas. Because one idea by itself simply may not be enough. One rejected idea when combined with another idea and another idea and another idea might actually make for an interesting innovation. I'm actually showing you in the next slide uh, the portfolio of Jim Lavoy, the CEO at the time when you know we wrote the case study. Uh, and as you can see, uh, his personal portfolio is divided into three columns. Uh, column one is savings bonds. There are a number of things, uh, you know, company credit card and the like. Uh, then there are a bunch of Bow Jones ideas. You will see that the stock market itself is a Bow Jones idea. You know, employees who actually develop mutual funds said, hey, why can't we actually offer this to a bunch of other people? And then you actually have SPASDAC ideas for completely new products altogether. And um, you can see that there are many more Bow Jones ideas, more savings bonds, and uh, dare I say, fewer SPASDAC ideas. Um, and another striking thing, of course, is you will see if you total up what is in the savings bond column, the Bow Jones column, and the SPASDAC column, the total exceeds $10,000. And the reason, of course, is as employees uh, volunteer, as they buy stock, the value of the stock naturally rises in the enterprise. A word about SPASDAC ideas. Uh, it's very hard for anybody to come to you and say, hey, come up with a far-out idea for a new customer. I mean, that's not a meaningful uh, instruction or a meaningful mandate or a meaningful charter. Instead, the way employees at Right Solutions develop SPASDAC ideas is when they go about solving problems in their daily lives. So let me illustrate it with a striking example. There was actually a young software designer. She had two kids. Um, and I think one of the kids who I believe was 10 years old or so came to her and said, Mom, uh, you know, I have to teach my class about soils. And, uh, you know, earth and soils, they seem to be a boring subject. How can I make this interesting? And uh, this employee who was a mom quickly thought about it and said, Ah, I could use a software engine to develop um, a little bingo game where students can participate and, uh, uh, you know, gather knowledge about soils in a fascinating way. And it worked really well the first time when she tried it in her 10-year-old's class. Then she actually went to the younger daughter's class and tried it there. And then there the teacher actually told the younger daughter's class told her that was one of the most exciting days in her life. And that's when this young lady actually went to one of the prophets. And, of course, it actually got put on mutual fund. And what's amazing is this idea that they developed eventually got sold to uh, Hasbro, the toy company. And what's amazing is... Hasbro, the toy company, their R&D unit is uh, four miles from where the headquarters of Right Solutions was located. What's even more interesting, of course, is that people had never considered this toy maker to be a customer, even though it was so close because they were so focused on casinos and the Department of Defense. And you can see how an idea generated by somebody in the enterprise actually uh, was interesting enough for a toy manufacturer to consider this to be of value to them and consider this to be of relevance uh, to them. Since then, uh, the toy manufacturer, of course, has become one of their customers, and that's what SPASDAC ideas continually do over time. So what does the company do with this idea market? Um, as you can well imagine, instead of the boss picking the top best ideas, they actually rely on the top 15 stocks in the stock market. And this slide gives you a quick visual of a variety of um, stocks that were in play at that time. And what the company does is it puts real money. And they have a lovely phrase to describe it. They call it adventure capital and not venture capital. Uh, they put this money uh, to, to implement the ideas contained in these uh, stocks. 
So I asked Jim LeBoy, the CEO, and his colleague, the CEO, why don't you guys choose the stocks? And they tell you, look, you know, we're not the smartest people. We can't figure out which of these stocks is really going to work, and that's exactly why they rely on the stock market. Uh, the next slide hopefully gives you an overview uh, of employee participation. So you can see over a period of time, and this was actually over an 18-month period, uh, a large fraction of employees began to participate uh, in the stock market. Of course, all of them aren't generating ideas. Some of them are. Others actually might be commenting on other people's ideas. Most important, many might actually be volunteering on ideas developed by other people. And in fact, one of the amazing things that both the CEO and the COO of Right Solutions can do is they can instantly tell you who the best citizens of the company are. And how do they know? They actually can tell you who participates most, who comments most uh, on the ideas of other people, and um, who, of course, uh, volunteers on the ideas of other people. And these people actually get a reward. By the way, when ideas succeed, all of the people who've been involved in developing the idea get a reward. And it's not necessary always that the originator gets the most reward. You might originate an idea, but you might not know how to implement it. And there may be others who might actually have done the heavy lifting, and they get a share of the rewards that is corresponding to their contribution. Uh, the next slide gives you a quick overview at Right Solutions about the growth of stocks in the company. Uh, the blue line is the total number of stocks in the company. The orange line gives you the number of savings bonds ideas in the company. The green line is the number of Bow Jones ideas. And uh, the purple line gives you an idea of the number of SPASDAC ideas. And as you can well imagine, uh, cost-saving ideas predominate, followed by Bow Jones ideas, uh, followed by SPASDAC ideas. But look at the numbers. Uh, for an organization of 150 people or so, they have 50-plus ideas in the market. This, of course, doesn't include ideas that have been sold off to other people because for a company with 150 people, it's very hard for them to implement each and every idea. So one of the things they're doing right now is they're shrink-wrapping these ideas, as it were, and selling the IP to somebody else uh, because they can't implement them. But nonetheless, 50 ideas listed in a market in a company with 150 or so employees means for every three employees, they have one actionable idea, and that is astonishing, if you would ask me. Every firm has, if you will, a defining symbol. Um, for instance, uh, if you walk into the headquarters of Qualcomm in San Diego you, and you go to their lobby, you may not see pictures, but instead you might actually see um, patents that the company has acquired over time. And what uh, the lobby with all of the patents signals to you is we believe, of course, that knowledge matters, that knowledge is the most central asset of the enterprise. And uh, um, that is exactly what the design of the lobby communicates. What is striking at Right Solutions is when you walk into their lobby, they actually have a puzzle on the floor, in fact, on the carpet. And that's the puzzle that's out there in front of you uh, in the slide. The puzzle is in uh, red and blue. And uh, Jim Lavoy, the CEO, says, along with his colleague, the COO, says, look, uh, the red is all the questions that an employee has. The blue is what the company ought to be thinking about. And his point is, if you really want to engage employees in participating in innovation, you need to get them to contribute, but you need to get them to contribute by answering all of these questions. Um, Jim's point is very simple. <clears throat> Excuse me. He says, any company asks of an employee, can this person do the job? And, of course, the employee in turn asks, can I do this job and shall I behave? And what that creates is the basis for a transactional relationship. Jim's point is, if you really want to create a culture of innovation, you really ought to answer all the other questions that an employee has. Am I important? Are they asking me? Are they listening to me? Do I belong? Do they care about me? Are they recognizing me? Are they rewarding me? Not just for existing employees, but conceivably alumni as well. And in turn, if the company answers these questions, it has to actually signal that they care and trust employees, that they think about the future, and they really want the employees to contribute to the future. 
At Wright Solutions, one of the interesting things is when you join the company, uh, on day one by 4 p.m., you have access to all of the intellectual property of the company because you can actually see everything on mutual fund in an unrestricted manner. Of course, if you ask them uh, what are the core processes that sustain right solutions, they will tell you there are two core processes. One is how we hire people. They're very careful about the kinds of people who, who they hire. And the second core process they will tell you is the process, of course, for killing ideas and the guts of which is the, the market called mutual fund. I, I wanted to t give you a very granular and detailed account of one company so that you understand how the process of killing ideas works. And I thought uh, uh, this is actually the appropriate time for us to sort of back away a little bit and see right solutions in a larger context. Um, and if we step back from right solutions and look at firms in a larger context, um, Let's actually start with defining what an innovative organization is. Uh, any, any innovative organization has three characteristics, and this slide indicates that the three characteristics are its ability to generate ideas, its ability to select ideas, and its ability to implement ideas. So you need to have lots of ideas. You've got to select them, and you've got to execute them. The point, of course, as we saw in Right Solutions, is our ability to do all of these three things hinges crucially, decisively, on how we design the process for killing ideas. In fact, the process for killing ideas is one that actually uh, can play a big role in imbuing the enterprise with the will to innovate, um, and um, it can also constitute a set of social tools for people to innovate. And most importantly, it can actually be a system for evaluating ideas. Let's take a look at each of those circles, the circles of the will, the circles of ideas, and the circles of tools. So what's interesting at Right Solutions is mutual fund, on the one hand, sustains the will to innovate. It is a tool to innovate. It is also a system to gather and, of course, kill ideas at the same time. So let's take a look at will. Some of you, when the word will is mentioned, might think of philosophers like Rousseau or Hobbes or uh, John Locke. But I'm a social scientist, and for me, the will to innovate is very behavioral. When I go to an organization, I typically look at four things, and they're at the right extreme of this slide under the label will. And for me, I know that a company has the will to innovate when I go to meetings and I see employees asking questions when you actually observe employees sharing knowledge and information, when you see employees taking risks, and when, of course, you see employees borrowing from other companies. So those really are the four manifestations, the behavioral realizations of will, if you um, will. How are these four behavioral manifestations of will produced in an enterprise? And if we summarize 40 years of research, uh, what all of that research um, can be distilled down to is that four emotional experiences are at the core of the will to innovate. One is uh, the feeling of psychological safety. The second is the feeling that you trust the firm and the firm trusts you. The third is the feeling of fun, and the fourth is the feeling of confidence. And what this slide shows is how those four feelings, as it were, drive uh, innovation by fostering the will to innovate and produce and underpin all of the four manifestations uh, of the will to innovate. So a word about each of these things. Psychological safety means I feel safe in my workplace. Nobody's going to make fun of me. Nobody's going to ridicule me. Trust means I trust the enterprise, and uh, the enterprise trusts me. So at Right Solutions, having access to all the IP is one uh, indicator, if you will, of trust. And the other thing is innovation isn't a chore. It's fun. It's uplifting. It's energetic. And then the other piece is that there is confidence uh, in the enterprise. So how can you actually develop all of this. Uh, I'm going to focus on the willingness to take risks and something that companies can do very easily uh, to ensure uh, that uh, they, they sustain the will to innovate is to figure out when they can kill ideas. 
Uh, and here, what this slide uh, depicts is a simple um, graph. On the y-axis, you have the cost of an error or a mistake, and on the x-axis, you have the cost of a pro you have the project timeline. And of course, uh, the later you kill an idea, uh, the more resources by then you would have presumably poured into it. And so the costlier it is for you to kill the idea, you might in fact even be reluctant to kill the idea, only for it to go to the marketplace and then be killed in this instance by consumers. Of course, when that happens, the rest of the enterprise becomes gun shy because they've seen one big failure and they become very hesitant to take risks. Instead, the smart thing, of course, is to actually kill ideas as early as possible. So one of the ways you can do it is to prototype and fail fast. And one of the nice things that Right Solutions does is they kill ideas, for, for example, at the profit stage. If you don't get the support of one person, ideas disappear there. Even if they're listed, if nobody is actually buying the stock, if nobody is discussing the stock or coming up with ideas to improve the basic premise behind the stock or volunteering, ideas get killed there as well. And so the earlier you kill an idea, the much better it is. And so that's kind of an important uh, thing to keep in mind. Uh, let me then quickly sort of move on to borrowing. Borrowing is a very important part of uh, the will to innovate. Um, you know, a lot of ideas that are new are actually borrowed. I mean, in fact, uh, uh, you can think of um, uh, the Andon cord system at Toyota where workers in a factory pull a cord in order to stop the production train. Where did the designer of the Toyota system of production get the idea from? Uh, obviously by observing people in a bus or a train because that's what we do in order to get the bus or the train to stop. So there are many ways in which we can actually uh, you know, borrow. So you can actually get, uh, uh, you know, your workers to go through sabbaticals. Uh, Milken in South Carolina sends its uh, um, manufacturing supervisor to every new customer when they ship a product there for the first time to go figure out how do they use our product and what is it we can learn that can actually kind of help us improve. So uh, what's important is you really need to sustain a high trial rate. Uh, you want people to keep coming up with ideas. And uh, here's Jeff Bezos at Amazon. He has a monthly reward for employees who act without getting permission first. And this is a great example to tell people, look, you don't need to be hemmed in by rules. Rules don't need to sap your initiative. Quite the contrary. Uh, so keep trying with ideas. Let's move to um, uh, ideas then. And as you can see, this slide gives you uh, four simple things about ideas. Ideas need to be generated. Uh, an idea by itself may be of little use, and therefore idea, an idea might have to be combined with another idea. It then has to be selected and then has to be executed. And the point of this slide is to say the system for doing so once again has to be predicated on these four core emotions. If people feel unsafe, they don't trust the enterprise, it's not fun, they don't have confidence, they're not going to generate ideas. Instead, they're always going to wait for your approval as a boss. Uh, they're not going to speak up. They're not going to say very much. So ideas are going to go a-begging because they're actually going to remain in the heads of employees. They're going to be, most importantly, unspoken and never come into the spoken realm of the enterprise. Right Solutions isn't the only paradigm or way to organize the process of killing ideas. Here's Whirlpool, and they take an internal venture capital approach. And what this slide shows you is um, Whirlpool has a pipeline. If you ask them, what is your innovation portfolio, they'll tell you, look, we actually have a whole bunch of business concepts. And these are, you know, simple ideas for which funding is given very easily. Often a team of two or three people can get together, they can write a page, and then they can ask for funds, and these funds are very readily provided. Uh, you know, uh, you can actually think of these, if you will, uh, as $5,000 sort of ideas. If they work, uh, you know, your business concept can flower into an experiment. And you will, of course, have far fewer experiments because ideas are being killed at this stage as well. And the experiment, you, you will receive, of course, more money than $5,000 to, uh, you know, uh, see if your experiment works. And, of course, if your experiment works, you can actually go to the prototype stage. And you can see that the number of prototypes are far fewer than the number of experiments. And if your prototype works, you can actually scale up and actually enter the market. So that's another way to kind of organize innovation in any enterprise. 
Let me close with a quick account of social tools. In any enterprise, for it to be innovative, you need tools to connect, to mobilize, to evaluate, and simplify. And mutual fund does all of that. It connects people into a community. It mobilizes teams. You don't even need to appoint a team. It's a system for evaluating ideas, and it's very simple. There are three buckets, three actions that you can take, and the actions are buy, discuss, volunteer. And once again, it actually depends on the core emotions of safety, trust, fun, and confidence. Um, you, of course, need the high trial rate. Uh, as I've sort of mentioned again, this is an example of a company called the Alabama Gas Company. It has, I believe, been, since then been acquired. At one time, the CEO used to give out visiting cards to employees when he visited them. One side had the name of the card, uh, the name of the CEO, and the other side was a get-out-of-jail card. And what the CEO would do each time he gave his visiting card to his employees was he would tell them, try an idea. If it doesn't work, turn the card in. Nothing will happen to you. And his point is, I don't want them to quit even before they've tried anything. Uh, and I sort of want to make sure they actually contribute to uh, the idea generation process. So hopefully that um, has given you enough uh, material for you to think about why designing the process to kill ideas, in fact, uh, is the very foundation to gather ideas and to actually implement them. And I'm going to turn things over to uh, my colleagues here so that they can actually give you some more information, after which I understand we can actually take some questions. Yes, well, thank you so much for that um, insightful presentation. Um, before I begin my session, I'm, this is Carissa Little here, um, I'd like to really encourage you to submit questions throughout my portion of today's presentation because we will be hosting a question and answer session with Professor Rao. Um, so we at Stanford are really pleased to be offering the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Certificate Program in partnership with academic directors Professor Rao and Professor Sutton. Uh, this is a new certificate that we launched in September of this year, and it was designed for managers, engineers, and leaders of an innovation teams, or any team that wishes to be innovative, as well as entrepreneurs or intrapreneurs or those that aspire to be so, um, along with professionals and project teams really in both public or private uh, organizations or enterprises. The School of Engineering and the Graduate School of Business decided to partner to create this offering because we've been hearing for quite some time that organizations really struggle both with innovation and entrepreneurship and how to make those things routine within their organizations. We've designed a custom interface that allows for interactivity and collaboration in a self-paced environment. Uh, there are assignments with TA feedback so that we can ensure that there's content retention. Uh, the certificate program requires uh, students to complete eight courses uh, in order to earn the entire certificate. I also wanted to highlight some upcoming innovation offerings that we have. You can see here we have a couple of webinars in November and January, and there's some details there. We're very uh, lucky to have Jeffrey Moore joining us on November 28th. Um, and Perry Claibon and Jeremy Utley, who are co-teaching a, a very interactive course, will be hosting a webinar on January 29th, and that course will launch in and around the same time frame as that webinar. I also want to highlight that we have a new course here as a part of the Stanford Innovation and Entrepreneurship Certificate, Creating Demand, which is uh, taught by Linda Kate Smith and Donna Nowitzki. Um, and so uh, there's some details there if you'd like to, to pursue that further. So I'd like to just take a moment. We really appreciate you uh, participating in this webinar, and we hope to get some feedback from you about your level of interest in the Stanford Innovation and Entrepreneurship Certificate. Um, we'll keep the polls open for a few moments here. Thank you very much for that feedback. Um, and with that, I'm going to do some question and answers here. Give me a moment to get a couple of the questions ready. Um, so, Professor Rao, um, what do you think would be the limit of this mechanism in terms of the number of ideas and employees in a scalable uh, that's scalable across multiple countries and global country or global companies? Thank you. 
Solutions is it has 150 employees. Very important to the success of something like this. If you want to scale this type of an idea generation mechanism in a large global enterprise, which has many divisions, many subunits, it would not make sense to have one right solutions for the entire firm. Instead, what you need are many such right solutions for small such units. The reason is simple. When you have actually 150 employees, you can imagine what's going to happen in that small unit. Namely, um, uh, this will be the subject of corridor conversations, uh, water cooler talk, coffee table talk, and so forth. In a large enterprise, if it's simply put there, the easiest for, thing for people to do is to say, let somebody else do it. And so what you want to do is to kind of make sure you actually size it properly. This, you know, small subunits, very, very uh, important for you to uh, think about that. And by the way, the other imp very important thing to keep in mind is uh, the culture of the company, of course, uh, also ought to be important. Um, if you have a culture where mistakes are lethal, mistakes are fatal, it's very hard to kind of do something like this. Uh, you need to sort of make sure you move from a mistake culture, if you will, to a prototype culture. Well, thank you. Um, our next question here, Professor Rao, how do you see these types of ideas work in more mature organizations, say those with the size of a Fortune 500 company? Uh -huh. So, as I was mentioning a little while ago, uh, for a Fortune 500 company, part of what you would want to do is to use this type of a system as a complement to existing things. Large organizations love the idea of innovation jams and so on, where the entire enterprise congregates together once, or often they think about things such as innovation contests that are once a year kind of events. And this is sort of much more organic, much more kind of natural. And once again, what's very important is how you structure the enterprise. So uh, there's a very famous uh, uh, idea sometimes referred to as Dunbar's Law. And what uh, Robin Dunbar was an anthropologist and uh, studied um, baboons, uh, chimpanzees, gorillas, and human beings, and calculated that the optimal size of the band for human beings was 148.7. And his point was villages would begin to subdivide at that point in time. Tribes would begin to subdivide at that point in time. And Dunbar's notion was that when you actually got to 150, uh, you actually needed to devote a lot of attention to what he referred to as grooming activity. So if you think of chimpanzees, what do they do? They groom each other. They comb their hair. They, you know, they do all of this. Of course, we human beings don't do all of that. We have, um, uh, you know, if you will, language. And most importantly, we have cultural rituals that bind us together. The point is, in organizations that are smaller sized, it's easy to create these sorts of rituals that glue the company together and then actually have something like right solutions uh, to, to, to serve as a mechanism to uh, build and extend, uh, you know, uh, the cultural behaviors of people in the company. Uh, in a large, mature organization, um, you know, where uh, you have lots of rules and so forth, you might even use something like right solutions as a great way of killing rules, rules that actually get in the way of innovation. You could even make that fun, too. That's interesting. So it's sort of in contrast, there's a question here um, about how can an early stage entrepreneur kill ideas when they don't have the luxury of affording many employees? Uh -huh. That's a great question. <clears throat> Um, the way, you know, entrepreneurs can actually, uh, you know, kill ideas in a startup, and if I understand the question correctly, is by interacting with consumers, or at least uh, potential consumers. Um, that's often a great way to not kill ideas as much as modify ideas. Uh, you know, um, prototypes are based on a startup, and, uh, you know, or startups rather are based on a prototype. And what you have with your prototype or idea is you test it with consumers. You quickly figure out their willingness to buy, their willingness to pay. That's a simple way to, to do that. And the nice thing about startups, of course, is everybody is doing everything. It's a very small organization. As one person, as one writer uh, likened the startups to, uh, you know, beach volleyball. 
there isn't a whole lot of bench strength. Uh, people are playing together. They're improvising, and so often customer feedback might be a very nice way to 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 ensure that you kill ideas. So uh, the point, of course, for a startup here is. Uh, even with few people, you can actually get interesting ideas as well, provided you've actually hired these people very carefully. Great. And one final question here is maybe you can explain a little more what you mean by best citizens of a company. Yeah, that's a great question again. Most of us, we when we work in organizations, we can be myopic. We can do our job. We can, of course, cooperate with other people, but that cooperation can be, how shall I put it, uh, um, uh, you know, episodic, very project-driven, and so forth. Uh, you know, the best citizens of the company are people who um, go above and beyond the call of duty. They help other people. And... Uh, um, how do they help other people? They help other people develop their ideas. They help other people not only develop their ideas, but also to implement them. So uh, they don't get their own self-interest in the way. That's sort of what I mean by uh, being a great citizen of uh, a company. You always ask yourself, what's good for the institution? And then you do the right thing, even when nobody is looking at you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Um, we really appreciated having you here today, Professor Rao. I just want to take a few moments to do some closing announcements. Uh, we will be making this webinar available both on our YouTube channel, and we'll be sending out an email announcement when that's ready and available. Um, as Roni mentioned at the beginning of the session, you can download the slides as any, at any time uh, by clicking the print to PDF icon. Um, if you have any more questions, uh, please uh, let us know. We will be uh, waiting to answer any of the content questions that we didn't get to that are still in the queue. And thank you very much for joining us today.